program focusing on the sustainment. And our first uh, speaker is John Jensen. And John comes from Huntsville. He's the, uh, the aviation director for the MCOM uh, Logistics Center. So welcome, John, and look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so I'm the lucky one to have uh, the uh, first briefing after lunch. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Quad A leadership uh, for the opportunity to um, speak to everybody. Uh, this, who knows, this might be my swan song since um, I'll be retiring in January. But, um, uh, you know, it's nice to get together and see a lot of old friends that, uh, that I've worked with uh, over the years. Um, I want to call attention to the title of, uh, of the briefing. You know, the, it's maintaining aviation readiness to fight. You know, um, what we're doing is we're, we're in a transition time now. You know, it's, a, it's already been discussed how we're uh, in the process of transitioning from a, from a wartime op-tempo to a peacetime op-tempo. And a lot of times we, um, we get into a mindset of peace. And the one thing that we can't do, we can't get back to that mindset of peace. We have to be ready to fight, and the supply chain has to be ready to fight. Let's see if it works. Okay, um, I just wanted to call your, your attention to this. Uh, this is the uh, aviation supply chain leadership uh, at AMCOM. Um, you see the, uh, the five horsemen uh, up there in the upper right. Uh, that was a term that was, uh, that was coined by, uh, by General Pillsbury back when he was the, uh, the uh, commander of AMCOM. And uh, he liked to uh, get us all together uh, you know, once a week and uh, grill us about uh, what we're doing to, um, to uh, set, to uh, resolve any kind of parts issues uh, for any of our aircraft that were uh, in the fight. So we went tail by tail number by tail number, and uh, all these people were responsible for for answering to their aircraft. Okay, what platforms do we uh, am I going to talk about? I'm going to specifically talk about uh, the attack cargo and uh, Black Hawk mostly. Um, Reason why is because uh, our unmanned aerial systems and the non-standard uh, rotary wing aircraft, they're, uh, they're all uh, managed uh, by non-standard techniques such as uh, CLS and PBL. But, um, but my focus is going to be on the supply chain for uh, the other systems. And I, uh, I want to point out, uh, you know, we're, we're not losing sight. Yeah, we're losing uh, our scout directorate. The scout directorate will be uh, uh, going away as the as the Kiowa warrior is divested. But um, but there's more work to be done. You know, we've um, we're standing up the uh, future vertical lift in ITEP uh, PM. Um, I believe uh, 2016 is the first year that they're actually going to have some uh, some funding, and we will be staffing the uh, the log team. On uh, in that PM. Okay, what's the Army aviation role? I, I know I probably don't need to uh, to tell um, most of you guys this because you lived it. Um, but um, the the main thing is uh, Army aviation. When you know, it's not there just to uh, train people to fly, it's to train people to fight. The um, in. The, and that's something that our supply chain needs to be ready to do too. Um, you know, we've got pilots who are uh, are well trained, who are uh, are are uh, learning the combat skills. And the one thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that the supply chain is ready to support them. So, what's aviation readiness when we're uh, referring to equipment? You know, the traditional definition is uh, up there on the, uh, up on the upper uh, right. You know, it's number of aircraft that are fully mission capable. You know? Okay. So, um, so does that mean that the, that the supply chain's ready? No. So the, uh, the, on the bottom there, I give just a uh, simple depiction 
of uh, what does the aviation enterprise look like and what, uh, what needs to be ready to support uh, those, uh, those aircraft that are going into the fight. So it takes everything. All organizations play a part. Yeah, it's, uh, if, if I don't get uh, the funding I need uh, at AMCOM, then I'm not going to be able to issue the contracts. If I can't issue the contracts, then uh, the vendors aren't going to be able to deliver the parts. And one key aspect of the, uh, of the enterprise is CCAD. So, um, so keeping uh, CCAD a, a viable organization is key to us being able to be ready to support the next conflict. Okay, some of you may have seen a chart similar to this uh, in the past, but uh, this is the cycle. This is what we go through every time we, uh, we go into a major conflict and then it ends. We go from, uh, from the highs to the lows. And uh, there's no reason to believe that that's not going to happen again. Okay, so what ends up happening uh, to the supply chain when we transition to peacetime? Well, it's already happening. You know, I've got uh, AMC, uh, you know, beating on me to reduce my inventory um, back down to a uh, level that, uh, that is adequate to support peacetime demand. Okay, if my inventory is structured to support peacetime demand, then I'm not going to be ready for the next fight. So um, one of the ways that they try to do that to us is they, uh, they reduce our uh, Army Working Capital Fund uh, funding. So if I don't, um, if, uh, if my inventory is not, re not uh, being reduced the way that, uh, that they want it to be reduced, they'll cut my funding you know, to try to force us to reduce it. And also we're going through the flying hour program reductions, which influence what's happening in our automated system. As our flying hours go down, our, uh, our demands that are in the system go down. And uh, so it becomes even more difficult to defend uh, holding on to inventory. So what's going to be the result? Well, back orders are going to start growing. Stock availability is going to go down. And uh, I hope not, but uh, you, we, uh, we may end up seeing readiness reduced. Okay, let's look at uh, what happened uh, from, the, from before uh, the, uh, the current uh, conflicts in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. What, what, what happened? What did the supply chain look like? And, uh, and where are we today? Well, you see the, the, the top line, the top line is our inventory. And we, um, at the height, back in, uh, in 2006, 2007 time frame, our inventory was up to $7.7 .7 billion. That seems a lot, like a lot, doesn't it? Except I was supporting sales of, uh, of almost $5 billion out of that $7 billion of inventory. So uh, now the sales are going down. The, uh, the one thing that really scares me is if you look at those uh, at that red line on the uh, second line from the bottom, that's our due in. That's how much I've got on contract that's still to be uh, delivered. So it it uh, it's kind of scary, but um, but I'm um, we don't have any choice but to try to reduce our inventory, uh, you know, back down to a reasonable level to support our uh, demands going forward. The big question is, what should our inventory be? Okay, here's an interesting picture. Here's what, uh, what happened at the depot. You know, the blue line is, uh, is the dollar value of the depot programs. This is just for components. This isn't uh, for, uh, for the airframe programs. This is just for components. At the, at the, uh, the height, we were at almost a billion dollars worth of uh, component business at the depot. And now we're down to uh, between 400 and 500 million. So it's a tremendous decrease in, uh, in the workload at the depot. 
And uh, one of the things that I've got my guys looking at is, um, you know, are we overcompensating for, um, for the demand decreases? So one of the things we're, um, we're trying to do is figure out how can, we, uh, how can we at least maintain a level of workload at the depot to maintain our competency and maintain uh, the ability to surge. Waiting to hear any of those answers too. So, anybody has any <laughs> answers? Or, um, all ears. Well, I know. <laughs> okay, uh, the flying hour program. You know the uh, it, the that line there uh, shows uh, what's happening with our flying hour program going forward. Uh, you know, so uh, a lot of the decreases because of the Kiowa Warrior coming out, but still it's quite a drastic uh, decrease. You know, so we're talking about a thirty percent drop in the flying hour program. So now, you know, seeing what um, seeing what uh, what happened to us in the past, you know, a year or so ago, um, you know, I I was uh, I always tell everybody I do my best thinking uh, in the shower in the morning when I'm washing my hair. So I was taking a shower and I was going, well, doggone it, same thing's going to happen. You know, how can we end up uh, avoiding the problems that we had uh, during uh, during the war? So what ends up happening? What kind of mistakes do we always make? You know, back uh, in the 90s, uh, after the first Gulf War, uh, we went through the same cycle. We, uh, we got the pressure from AMC. Uh, our demands went down. We got pressure to throw away stuff. So we were throwing away main rotor blades. We were throwing away gearboxes just to meet an inventory reduction target. And then what ends up happening? Then the conflict starts, and what's the first thing that we have to go on out and buy? We have to go on out and buy uh, main rotor blades, transmissions. And these are long lead time parts. One of the problems we have in aviation is, uh, is the production lead times to, uh, to get anything on contract and to get it delivered. You know, I talked to our, um, our counterparts at TACOM, you know, and uh, we were talking about uh, production lead times, and they said, oh, yeah, our production lead times are really long. I said, well, well how long? I said, well, it takes 8 to 12 months for some of our items. And I laughed at him. I said, do you realize that for uh, some of our items, like Chinook uh, gearboxes, it takes us anywhere from, uh, from 24 to 36 months just to get it uh, delivered from contract? And, that's, uh, and I think that's one of the things that we, we need to be conscious of, is that within aviation, because of our standards, it takes a lot longer for us to get things. So we have to take that into consideration when we're figuring out uh, what to do going forward. So what I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to develop a strategy for, uh, for how to compute what we need to get us through, not through a war, you know, if, if somebody came to me and they said, uh, how, much, uh, how much inventory do you need to fight a war? And you know what I'd tell them? I need what I have today. But AMC is not going, and DA are not going to allow us to, to maintain a wartime level of inventory. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how can we reduce it down to a reasonable level, but allow us to survive the ramp up time. So that's, that's the critical point, is trying to survive the ramp up time for the supply chain to catch up. So, you know, when I, uh, when I approached AMC with the problem, they said, oh, well, that's what war reserves for. And, uh, and I laughed. You know, um, back, uh, back during the start of the war, you know, I, uh, I wanted to issue uh, some of our war reserves, and uh, headquarters DA told me no. And I said, wait a minute, I, I don't understand. So uh, we had to have an aircraft on the ground in theater before we were allowed to issue war reserves to do what? To fight a war. So, uh, so the whole war reserve concept just, uh, just doesn't, it doesn't meet our need for what we need for a real conflict. So if you look at um, if you look at these numbers here, like look at the main rotor blade, 
The war reserve requirement uh, that's computed and uh, in the system, in our, uh, in our uh, ERP system, is 81. Our, uh, our monthly demand, our monthly demand during the war was 125. So we had less than uh, one month's worth of, uh, worth of stock uh, in war reserves. So it's grocery, grossly inadequate to meet the need. Okay, so what we did is we did an analysis to, uh, to go ahead and try to compensate for the ramp up times. So it takes us time to get uh, contracts on board. It takes time to get the supply chain fully energized. So if I go to, uh, to Sikorsky or Boeing and I say, hey, I need uh, you know, uh, 50 uh, transmissions. <clears throat> well, they're going to say, okay, and, but it's going to take time. It takes time for them to get their vendors ramped up. So, uh, so it's something it, we have to consider not only for that one end item, but all the different piece parts. It takes time to ramp up uh, all the piece parts that are required to support a depot program. So, uh, so we can't immediately ish, uh, uh, induct you know, uh, 200 uh, transmissions and expect them to get spit out right away because we're not going to have the piece parts for it. Time for raw material and forgings. Remember uh, back in the uh, beginning of the war, um, titanium was a big issue. It's not so much of an issue now, but back then it was a big issue. And, uh, and we, there was a shortage of titanium within the uh, supply chain. The other thing is forgings and castings. Uh, a lot of times the forgings and castings are our long lead time items. It, and then time to get the retrograde to start flowing. It takes at least six months from the time a war starts. It takes at least six months before we start seeing the first unservice bolts coming back. Well, what's that mean? That means Colonel Pogue can have his depot ready to go at the beginning of a war, but he doesn't have anything to produce because we don't have any unservice bolts to induct. So that's, it's a consideration that needs to go into, uh, into the analysis. And all of those, uh, the raw material lead time, the forgings and castings, processing time, and final assembly, these are all um, things that we can develop strategies for to resolve. You know, one of the things we were looking at on the, uh, on the, on the forgings and castings was to, uh, to start stocking them, start stocking forgings and castings. So that's a possible uh, solution for some of our long lead time items. Okay, and here's, what's the, here's the good part. You know, back, um, back at the beginning of the war, um, we didn't even know what our demand was going to be. You know, it was a, it was a crapshoot. You know, we kind of guessed, okay, it's going to be uh, two times the amount of our peacetime demand. And, uh, but now, because of, uh, of a lot of the data systems we have, we have the data. <laughs> We have the data that, um, of what our demand was before the war. We have the data from, uh, from the height of the war. So we can use that uh, in our analysis to try to figure out uh, what we're going to need. And so uh, what we did is we took a look at uh, how many service posts do I need and how many unservice posts do I need. The, um, it might sound kind of strange, you know, saying how many unservice posts do I need to, con to support a contingency, but the reason why is because I have to have something to prime the pump. Remember I said it takes six months to get uh, unserviceable back from, uh, from uh, theater of operations. Well, during that six months, my depot has to have something to be doing. So if I can, uh, if I can identify the number of unserviceables that I need to get me through that uh, six-month ramp-up time, then I can induct them they can be producing. So here's a, uh, a sample of, uh, of some of the analysis we did. And so what we did is we tried to identify uh, what are the longest lead time uh, parts that are required to, uh, to make some of our spares, and what are the longest lead times for, uh, for the repair parts to support repair programs. And we came up with a computation for a number of serviceables and a number of unserviceables. And again, if you look at the main rotor blade, 
you know, have uh, 812 service bowls and 216 unservice bowls. Now, it looks like a lot. You know, but you know what? I have that today. And so we have an opportunity to go ahead and figure out what would I need to support the next contingency. We have an opportunity to minimize the investment cost in inventory by making the right decisions today. So rather than throwing it away to be able to defend to hold on to that stock. Okay, so um, here's a um, here's a sample simulation that we did uh, for um, if I don't have that contingency stock. So I started at 130 uh, at the beginning of conflict, and uh, and the data that we used was based on uh, what we experienced during the first uh, months of uh, of uh, deploying our, our aircraft. So what ends up happening when uh, when we first deploy is we get hit with a ton of requisitions because everybody wants to, uh, to bring stock with them, and we also have to fill the, um, the uh, ASLs that are established in theater of operation. So, uh, so we see a tremendous increase in our demand, depletes our stock, and we uh, dig ourselves into a hole, and it takes us forever to dig out. So um, this is based on uh, some of the actual experience that we had on the main rotor blade. And as you can see, uh, you know, we got to in the simulation. We get, we never we never were able to get to a positive supply position. Here's the main rotor blade. If we had uh, had included that 812 service bowls and uh, um, and the 216 unserviced bowls, so we end up um, being able to live through the initial surge in, uh, in demand and we're able to support the, uh, the ongoing requirement. Okay, so what are our challenges going forward? Well, we need to balance the funding to what our critical requirements are. The, um, the Defending our, our, uh, our Army Working Capital Fund budget is, uh, is critical. We're going to be pressured to reduce inventory. Um, if you noticed on a, uh, one of the previous charts, in 2015, our uh, sales were, uh, were $2.3 billion. Well, my uh, Army Working Capital Fund obligations were only a million. So uh, just by that difference alone, we're going to be decreasing our inventory. The, um, I'm, I'm working to defend realistic inventory levels. So, um, you know, I've uh, been working with RAND on uh, whether or not we can adjust the, uh, the war reserve uh, computations to go ahead and, uh, and uh, consider the ramp up times that we need for, uh, for aviation. Now, the next bullet is, is very critical. Maintaining commercial and organic industrial base capabilities. One of our problems that we have in aviation is we have our standards are such that we have to have qualified vendors. If our demand goes down to the point where I, only, uh, I am only inducting unserviceables at the organic depot and I'm not using the commercial uh, sources, I'm going to lose them. They're, um, they're not going to be qualified anymore and that contributes to the, that ramp up time, the ramp up time to get them qualified, to get them producing. So it's something that we need to consider uh, from a supply chain perspective to, uh, to try to figure out how can we end up uh, keeping the organic industrial base viable and also the commercial industrial base. Then the next one, management of long-term uh, storage. Um, one of the problems that we're having with a lot of our aviation items, you know, we're, uh, you're, we're seeing it in the retrograde today. A lot of uh, our retrograde has gone out to Sierra Army Depot and, uh, and uh, we had our corrosion team going out there checking the items out and they found uh, it, it was a nightmare. You know, a lot of uh, inadequate uh, packaging, 
a lot of corrosion, um, and it's something that we've got to uh, get a handle on within the aviation community to go ahead and make sure that we're taking care of these high dollar value, long lead time parts that uh, we've, we're holding in our inventory. And the last bullet there, data rights. Within aviation, we're going to see, uh, see a lot of activity on trying to, uh, to uh, um, get our data rights back. You know, a lot of our OEMs, uh, you know, they don't like to hear that, but, um, you know, we're to the point where, um, you know, we, uh, we can't afford to, uh, to continue uh, the way that we have been with, uh, with data rights. And we're going to have to start uh, exercising our data rights with our OEMs. Um, you know, not saying that, uh, you know, we're going to get uh, level three TDPs or anything, but, uh, but we at least need our government purpose rights. And, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that uh, we'll hear some more on that over the next few years. Okay, any questions? Got to be some questions out there. General Yellen, uh, General Riggs uh, had a question earlier, but uh, isn't it time for you to step up? You defer? Oh, you yield at a time. Oh, I see the gentleman. Gentleman from uh, Kentucky yields his. Oh, here we go. We have a brave soul. Who's first? Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Kettemeyer, PEO Aviation. The six months that you said it took to get uh, serviceables back to the depot, that was... Unserviceables. Okay, Roger. That was, that was not airframes, that was just parts, right? Just parts. Thanks. I think we got somebody in the back. Who's in the back? Tony back here? Yes? No? Tom Stinson from Woodward. Um, has anybody done an analysis to say when you're shutting off and starting these suppliers, the difference or the amount difference between holding the inventory versus the startup costs again for that? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's what we're using in our uh, in our defense of uh, of holding the inventory. It's a, you know when when you figure and you know AMC and DA don't like this me to say this, but uh, you know, holding inventory is cheap compared to having the start of supply chain up again. Hey, John, Creston Cook, deputy at CCAD. You mentioned the uh, the concern about losing competencies at the depot and, yes. and the organic suppliers as well. Mm -hmm. and, and you had a few examples, uh, you know, main rotor blade. Uh, how do you and your team go about measuring that? loss of competencies well I haven't broken code on that one yet you know um, you know it's a uh, take take for example um, Blackhawk in a lot of cases during the war I had the organic depot I had CCAD producing at max capacity for uh, for what they could do I had Sikorsky producing at max capacity of what they could do, and then I had other uh, vendors producing, and I still couldn't keep up with the demand. So you can imagine, if I lose one of those sources, then, uh, then it, we're never going to be able to pull ourselves out. And I, and I figured that's a failure to the supply chain. That's a failure to the supply chain if I can't support a fight. You know, supporting peacetime is easy. You know, supporting a war is difficult. And that's what we have to be ready to do. Oh, here we go. Hi, I work with the uh, Kevin Reese in the aviation missile research down here at Corpus. Is ALC interested or be inclined to support funding of qualification on new repair technologies to support these future contingency operations? Yes. 
Yeah, you know, and even um, even when you consider um, you know maintaining, uh, I think it, there's also something that we need to take a look at is um, maintaining sources. You know, um, when we're looking at all of our commercial sources, you know, how can we end up? You know, we might not uh, uh, be able to afford to give them a uh, a contract for uh, for a hundred each or something, but at least to maintain the qualification. So, uh, so I think we have to look at what kind of strategy uh, do we need to put together to go ahead and at least qualify the sources. Garden. Hey, sir. I, I had to step out. I apologize for that in the middle of your briefing. But I wanted to know, as we, you know, through the course of the war, we have brought on new weapon systems. So Mike, Echo, Fox, and as we work through provisioning, uh, those aircraft, what, what challenges do you see in, in the future at, for, as you, as you say, the cycle of war, as you know, kind of trough out and work our way back up, what, what specific challenges do you see there with the new, the new components, new dynamic components the, on new weapon systems? The main thing is um, getting the data that we need to, to go ahead and establish the depot programs. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things I'm working with, uh, with our teams to go ahead and make sure that, uh, that we do that. So that, uh, you know, if we're, uh, um, you know, the mic model um, unique uh, parts that, uh, that we need to make sure that we get you guys uh, up and running. Thanks, sir. How you doing, sir? Bob Sharp, TCAT. Uh, you talked about the drawdown and, and the fact that uh, drawing down will have an impact on both the industrial base and the defense industrial base. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as part of that plan, is your team looking at a an overarching strategy so that your weapon system teams all are marching by the same rules on how much work is given to the depot versus how much work is given uh, to our, our uh, supporters, our OEMs. Yes. You know, but let's talk about, uh, let's talk about one thing that, uh, that I am, I'm getting pushed back from, uh, from my teams that we're trying to work through, and that's cost. So, um, so you know, um, we're obligated to, uh, to go ahead and make sure that we're, um, that we're doing the core quantity and for people who, uh, you know, you always say core and a lot of people think, oh, 50-50. No, I'm not talking 50-50. I'm talking about that core quantity that we are obligated by law to do at the depot. So, uh, so if it's 80 uh, main rotor blades for Blackhawk or, uh, or uh, 20 uh, transmissions for Apache, I'm obligated to do that. Anything above that is supposed to be competed. So, uh, so one thing that, that uh, we're doing uh, at, uh, at our level is we're looking at, well, I don't want to just cut off the depot. How can I end up giving a steady workload to the depot? Uh, and then, of course, uh, working with you guys to try to figure out how can we end up reducing uh, the, uh, the costs uh, for, uh, for doing the repairs at the depot. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of work still to be done on that. Okay, I think that might be about it. Okay. Thanks, John. We, we appreciate that. Some great insights.